so the number one was really, uh, I wish I had had, let's call it the big picture. So I really understood the options of investing in different asset classes, different locations. Um, and if someone would have just helped me get, uh, this kind of ties into number two, which is get, getting clarity on what I wanted and why I wanted uh, and why I wanted it. <clears throat> this took about 15 years for me to figure out. And maybe it's just because I'm a bit of a slow learner, but I can tell you based on my own just journey and experience, uh, very few people, I think, really know why they are investing in certain asset classes. And so I think just taking that extra time, um, I'll give you one quick um, just story, if you will. And my uh, initially, my focus was on value add apartments, <clears throat> but I was I was taken off course and I was kind of swayed into doing mobile home communities. And that one decision um, easily cost me $10 million uh, because I, I went after it. Now, I don't regret it because I, I learned a, a ton about business and it's really helped me kind of get into development. But looking back, uh, where the market was, the trajectory I was on in terms of just continuing down that path, but I was chasing the shiny object and and it um, it, it definitely impacted my ability to, uh, to make money um, it, you know, anyways. Okay. Number three, uh, the importance of specialization and how important focusing is. Uh, once again, like if, if I was to look back and say, like, just go all in on one asset class that you really believed in versus jumping around, that would have had um, a huge um, impact. Number four, the importance of relationships and the fact that they take time. Uh, it's very hard to develop. And I would say, I think in some cases, people underestimate how valuable one or two key relationships can be. And so I would put a lot of effort and energy uh, starting over into just really finding those those key relationships. Uh, number five, the importance of market timing, just essentially buying when like I wouldn't say the market today is is a buyer's market, although I, I, it depends on what market you're in, right? If you're in the US, I would say that, yes, it is a buyer's market. I think if you're in Canada, specifically like in Alberta, where I'm at, there's there's um, there's probably market. <laughs> sorry, kids are off to school, so there's a bit of distraction in my house right now. Um, I would say from a market timing perspective, the different asset classes are going to give different, um, they're, they're going to be better, right? Like I can tell you right now, retail and office, uh, for the most part, you are in a, a buyer's market. You're going to be able to demand, you know, as a buyer, much more favorable terms. Okay. So just knowing that is, is so valuable because I, I, I know when, <clears throat> when I used to coach, I would see new investors coming in and they were in like secondary tertiary markets and they were looking at like just run down decrepit, pieces of crap and these properties because the market was so frothy meaning there was so many buyers trying to find assets that they were trying to convince themselves that this was a good deal and i just said like today it might look like let's call it a deal because there's nothing else available but i can just tell you just given my my you know 18 years of being in the business that this is not a good asset you were going to get stuck with this when the market turns and I, and I, I sincerely hope, um, that they, they, they listen to that because it's very easy in a, in a micro, like it, like just in a finite period of time to get kind of enamored by a property and think that this is the one. Um, and I used to be like that myself until you have mentors that you've been around and they've been around for 30 or 40 years and they can just look at a property and know that this is not something that you want to own long term. Now, if the idea is you're going to take it, you're going to add value very quick and get out of it, you know, maybe. But um, uh, anyways, just really taking that extra time and having someone else to maybe give you some perspective as to whether or not that property is something you really want to own. Um, highly valuable importance of the right partners or having no partners. Uh, <clears throat> I can't emphasize this enough. Um, I've been very fortunate to have great partners, but I've also had partners that um, 
you know, I learned a lot of um, painful lessons. So, and, and I, th- I, I think the only thing I can say on this is oftentimes when you're new to a business or investing and you're considering having a partner, I think often the focus is all on like the wonderful things that are going to happen when the two of you or three or four, however many people it is, um, get together. My first suggestion would be like, until you actually experience some turmoil and some real issues, you're not going to see their true colors and you're not going to see that even in yourself in terms of how you respond. So I would say that's number one. Number two is I find having more than two, like two people, um, in, in a deal, uh, that are make, trying to make decisions. Like as soon as you start getting three, four people, uh, really, really challenging. Um, and one last thing is uh, in my experience, there's always an alpha and the alpha is like the ultimate decision maker. And if you don't have that, I think sometimes that's even worse. So, um, these are just my experiences, right? So other people might disagree. Um, I'm just sharing what I've learned and what, what has helped and what was, uh, uh, was challenging during the the times of going through it. Importance of understanding my strengths and playing to those. Um, I think too often investors like that have money uh, feel like they should be getting into their own deals where they would be much better off to just find operators or find people that know how to execute and just say, okay, like what what is my strength? My strength is I make good money. I could I could partner in some of these deals. Like I can tell you that some of the um, partners that I have in my deals right now, they really don't make any decisions. Uh, they put up a, the capital or they may backstop a loan, and they get extremely good <laughs> um, uh, returns for not having to put a lot of effort and energy into the the project. But guess what? they like they understand what it is that they're bringing to the table and they get rewarded for that so i don't think you necessarily need to be an expert at doing a development or retail or whatnot what you want to be an expert at is identifying people that you can trust that have this skill set and just know know where you fit into the equation i think that that's um often overlooked uh number eight importance of having proper expectations I'll just say this, like real estate investing, it's very difficult. It's a grind. And I think anybody that kind of sells you on the fact that it can be kind of quick and easy, um, I would I would uh, venture to say that they are uh, probably they haven't been in the business long enough and they haven't actually had to to do the work. Right. Like I, I think if you are raising capital and that is kind of the what what you bring to the table, then that's not that hard. Uh, in, in my experience, like raising money is is actually kind of fun. Uh, that's why I, that's why I've I've done that. But when you're actually at the property level and you're operating and you're actually having to do the day to day battles of getting tenants and fighting with municipalities and all the rest of it, um, it it is hard. Uh, number nine, real estate investing. It's not the only way, or what I would consider even the best way to invest your money. Um, I certainly feel that it is a way, but now that I've been exposed to some very successful people, uh, it's really opened my eyes and I'm I'm understanding where real estate investing fits into the the entire scope. But I only talk about real estate investing because that's all I really understand, right? If I start getting into stocks, bonds, or private companies, then I have to go to people that are experts and people that I trust in those other areas. And I would say for, for far too long, I've been maybe a little bit too close minded in terms of like, this is the only place to invest. I certainly have the majority of my money invested because I'm not even going to share some of the numbers that, that I'm able to do with my capital, but it's very active, right? Like if I was just putting it and and getting like a carry, like a six, 10, 12% return, um, there's definitely other options for that. Uh, number 10, um, this, I just made a note. I said, uh, too often people quit or go all into real estate and investing without enough capital or staying power. And I just put like 5 million is kind of the number. Um, it, it's a little arbitrary if you will, but just in my experience, I think too many people will, uh, and, and this was my, this was me, right? When I jumped into it, um, I had maybe like a million dollars at the time, uh, to invest, but uh, that 
that was also to live on, right? And so all of a sudden, two years to get my first commercial project. And then that took two years. Like, if you're not making money in the meantime, if it, it can create a situation where you're either chasing deals, you're getting into the wrong deals. Um, and I... I just didn't, I, 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 I kind of had the, like this pride about like being a full-time real estate investor versus saying like, okay, I need to make money. And the more money I make over here, then I can just continue to recycle my capital over here versus going on this yo-yo or seesaw of <laughs> making money, investing, waiting. Um, and it's, it's something that uh, I, I don't know if, um, how often other people kind of do this because I, I feel that a lot of investors I talk to, uh, they do have a full-time job and then they will kind of do it part-time. I went full-time and I experienced a lot of turbulence, if you will. And so my suggestion would be to wait or what I've done now is I've, I've merged like, okay, so I'm a real estate developer. I'm a partner in a construction company. Like everything is now aligned. And so it works very well, but it's taken a lot. Of, it's taken a long time to kind of get to that stage. Um, and then just as a bonus, I said, uh, syndications are good, but owning the deal, uh, f for yourself, uh, I, I feel is better. And so the last two deals I've done, uh, without partners and not to say that all deals will be done that way, but it is, uh, quite liberating to just be able to do a project without having, you know, five or 10 other uh, investors that you have to kind of consider not, not to say that. I do things differently, but it's just, you can operate a lot quicker. So anyways, those are just kind of uh, 10 things that I wish I'd known when I started investing. And I didn't uh, mention this, but <clears throat> in terms of the big picture, like I just kind of drafted this uh, the other day and it's, it's probably hard to see, but it's basically just a four by four grid. And at the top it's build. Uh, which is essentially most people that would be under $5 million. I'm, I'm suggesting you're in the building phase uh, or growth, if you will. And then the other side is keeping, right? So once you get to five and 50 million, you're probably keeping. So that's on the, the top of the, uh, the two boxes. And then down the side, you've got carry and performance. And carry, think of that as like just getting a return on your investment, 6%, 10%, whatever the number is. Performance is you are essentially going in for like a two to four X return, right? Like, like a multiple, right? You're going in. So oftentimes on a development that is, you know, on equity, getting like a two X multiple or three X multiple. Uh, that's generally how I'm looking at it. And so depending on where you are, right? Like if you're in build, but you're looking for performance, that's kind of where I'm at. Then you're looking to, um, to do developments and you're looking for repositioning properties. Um, number, let's say you are, um, keep and you're looking at carrying, right? That would be the opposite corner. That would be, most people would be looking at investing in core assets, right? In terms of, um, you know, probably when I say a core asset, that's an A property in an A location. And you're just happy with an 8%, 6%, 5% return, whatever it happens to be, depending on the market, um, Let's say you're looking at build and carry, that would be a little bit slower, but it would be probably a value add in a good location. And you might be in that eight to 12%. Um, so I think just understanding kind of where you are, what your focus is, how much energy and effort you have to put into it um, will help to determine what strategy you you use. And just taking a little bit of time to kind of think about that, I think is, is time well spent. So. Anyways, that's all I got. I got to get to my kids' first day of school. I uh, hope you have a great week. We'll talk to you later. Bye.